Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us here today for our town hall with the Georgetown Hospital Foundation and happy International Women's Day as well to all the fabulous women out there. My name is Sandra Taylor. I'm the executive director at the Georgetown Hospital Foundation, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's town hall. Uh, just a note that we are recording this and we will be posting it on the foundation's YouTube channel. So if you know of somebody that isn't able to make it at this time, um, it will be up either later today or tomorrow. So keep an eye on our YouTube channel if anybody wants to uh, view it again or uh, for those that can't make it today. We are excited to be connecting with you and we've gathered a wonderful panel of experts today. You will soon hear from them and receive an update on what's been going on at Georgetown Hospital over the last few months and also how we are moving forward. Um, obviously, we're still in the pandemic, so there's lots and lots that's going on. 2021 is uh, gonna be an interesting year for Georgetown Hospital. Uh, we're looking forward to a very significant anniversary. After many, many years of planning and community fundraising, uh, the hospital actually opened its doors 60 years ago in, uh, in June of 1961. So we have a 60 year anniversary coming up in June. So that's very exciting. As you can imagine, many things have changed over the last six decades. Um, there have been incredible advances in diagnostics, in medicine and surgery, um, which has had a profound impact on how diseases and conditions are now treated. Um, outcomes for many patients are much brighter today than they would have been back in 1961. Yet all you need to do is to visit Georgetown Hospital and walk the halls to see what hasn't changed. Uh, while our healthcare teams at Georgetown Hospital are still both highly trained and deeply compassionate, uh, you will also see that the building itself largely is the same as it was 60 years ago. And that means there are space constraints and aging infrastructure, uh, which certainly provides challenges and obstacles to delivering the comprehensive care patients deserve. And, uh, and the hospital I know is looking at that and what the future of healthcare is gonna look like at the hospital in the years to come. Something that hasn't changed over the last 60 years is the community support of the hospital. There has been such an outpouring of support and recognition for our healthcare heroes over the last year. It has really helped lift morale when times were tough. Uh, our donors have funded equipment which has allowed the hospital to safely restart surgeries and services and keep serving the public for all of the healthcare needs, not just COVID during this difficult time. Um, it's wonderful and very heartwarming to see that that community spirit is still alive and still burning brightly after six decades. So our fundraising as the foundation um, for the hospital this year has been truly remarkable. And it's thanks to you, our amazing donors. And we are going to, in fact, meet our, our commitments to the hospital this year, which at the, if you would told me that a year ago, I'm not sure I would have believed it because we had no idea what this past year was going to bring for us. So we are deeply, deeply thankful to all of our donors who stepped up in a difficult time and, and gave to the hospital. You will know uh, many of you because you've purchased tickets that we are running a 50-50 uh, draw and lottery online. Um, last month's jackpot was over $7,500 and we are already on track for another large 50-50 prize this time. Uh, the ticket sales for this month's draw end on March 16th at 9 p.m. and the draw itself will be on March 17th, which is St. Patrick's Day. So maybe you'll uh, win your own little pot of gold on St. Patrick's Day if you buy a ticket. And uh, you see online the, the, um, on the screen the, where you can get your tickets. It is all online at georgetown5050.com. I don't think I can overstate how important it was to receive your support this year. Um, when we first moved into lockdown, uh, just under a year ago, uh, none of us, as I said, truly knew what to expect. Um, what we were so heartwarmed to see was that the support for the hospital didn't change. So you see on screen some photos of the fundraisers that took place over the last few months. Um, for example, Lambert Lights, they've been running their light show at Christmas time for a number of years. They were able to do it this year uh, with social distancing, which was wonderful. Many, many people came, came out. And in fact, they donated $10,000 this year to the hospital, and they also gave to the Cancer Assistance Services of Halton Hills. Um, but cumulatively, cumulatively, they have raised over $100,000 for the hospital, which is unbelievable. And we thank them for their tremendous support um, once again this year. Uh, St. Andrew's Church raised over $5,500, which they've donated to the hospital, and they raised that through online auctions. 
Toyota ran their winter tire sale once again this year and donated the proceeds to the hospital once again. And Boston Pizza had their fabulous Valentine's Day promotion back in February, and uh, we're very thankful to be the recipients of the donations from that event. We'd like to also give a shout out to our longtime supporters, Paul Armstrong Insurance. They made multiple gifts last year, which really helped us as we got through everything. And we thank Paul Armstrong Insurance. They're such fabulous supporters of many organizations in the community, and we're grateful for their support of the hospital. We had back in September, our walk and run uh, for Georgetown Hospital. We raised actually a record amount despite everything and despite having to go virtual. Um, we'd like to thank our sponsors for that. Uh, RBC has been a fantastic presenting sponsor. Kia is our uh, online finish sponsor. Uh, they did lots for us, including help us give out the, the grab bags and the goodie bags that uh, each of the participants got. Amico of Georgetown, again, fantastic supporters. Superior Glove, another local company that stepped up. Uh, GBA, LLB Accountants, uh, great supporters of ours for a number of years, as is uh, Betty DeLiviera from Royal LePage, who also uh, chairs our uh, walk or run committee. So she, uh, she both contributes financially and also a lot of her time. So thank you, Betty. And Generations Physiotherapy, again, has been supporting us for a number of years. And we give a shout out to Ola and her team over there. They are doing a great job. They've had a, a tough year as well, um, but Ola always shows her support for community events and we appreciate that. We also have fantastic service clubs in this town. I don't think I need to tell anybody that, that I think everybody knows. Um, so we'd like to thank the Lions Club for their support, the Kiwanis Club, uh, the Royal Canadian Legion, uh, and all of the other groups that, that stepped up, did their own little fundraisers, uh, figured out a way that they could raise some money and, and make a donation to the hospital. It's, it's unbelievable how much that adds up and how much we are truly uh, grateful for all the support. And of course, who could forget the beer store? Uh, that remarkable, uh, successful campaign. Uh, we're we're pr quite proud that the Georgetown store was the store in throughout the whole province that raised the most monies through empties. And I think that shows the community spirit of this uh, of this community and the town, um, either that or they drink a lot of beer. We're not sure, but we're very grateful that that campaign raised over $100,000 for the hospital. We've actually had more individuals and businesses support Georgetown Hospital this year than ever before. So it, it has been truly amazing this year. We are looking ahead um, and we're looking to plan our fundraising for what's coming up. And although we aren't sure what's going to happen in terms of going back to in-person events and when we're able to do that, we do have some other opportunities already set up for people to get involved. So we have upcoming the virtual Shoppers Drug Mart Run for Women, and that'll raise money for women's mental health. That's happening in July. And our Walker Run for Georgetown Hospital will once again happen this year, the last Sunday of September, as it always does. Uh, so that will be Sunday, September the 26th. And uh, we hope to get everybody out for a fantastic day of fundraising that day. So watch our social media and our emails over the next uh, few months. We've got some more exciting plans in the works that we're not quite ready to unveil yet, but uh, we are trying to make this a fun event. We're gonna make them safe um, and we're gonna get uh, the community out hopefully and get some fresh air and get involved with us. So on behalf of the foundation staff, which includes Peggy, Connor, Jeff, and of course myself, we want to thank you for all your support of Georgetown Hospital. You've really stepped up this year. You're really having a positive impact on the patients. And uh, our mission here at the Georgetown Hospital Foundation is pretty straightforward. We raise money to help with the highest priority needs that the hospital identifies. And so to find out more information on what impact that has had, our panel is going to um, help, with, help me deliver some messages today. And I'm going to introduce them at this point. So our first speaker is going to be Cindy McDonald, who's the Chief Operating Officer at Georgetown Hospital. Cindy will be providing us with an update on our response to the pandemic, including the latest information on surgeries, patient visiting, and the status of our hospital clinics and programs. We also are thrilled to have back, he was at our last town hall if you saw him there, but Dr. Ananda Ghosh is a physician leader, quality and patient safety, also the medical lead for the COVID-19 assessment and testing centers at Halton Healthcare. And he'll provide, be providing some insights into the current COVID-19 trends, both in the region and throughout the province and information on COVID-19 testing and vaccinations. And we also have, I'm thrilled to have Helen Shelfot, 
I want to get her title right, Professional Practice Clinician for Rehabilitation and Geriatrics at uh, Houghton Healthcare. Houghton, Helen's, um, I think, got some great tips and tricks to help us stay active and healthy. We've been doing this a long time. We've been staying home a long time. And I think we could all use some new ideas on how we can help keep uh, active and healthy, particularly as we know spring is coming, but it's not quite here yet. So what are the, some of the easy things we can do to just uh, keep us going until the weather gets a little bit better and maybe we can get outside. The format for our town hall, uh, it's gonna be very straightforward. So you'll hear from each of our speakers. We are gonna follow up with a question and answer period. We'll start with some questions that have been sent to us in advance of today's event. We will also be accepting questions um, submitted during the town hall. So if you're on Zoom, um, you can use the question and answer function or if you're watching on Facebook Live, you can just put your question in the comments box. We will be uh, monitoring that. And uh, I think we should just dive right in and get started now. So I'd like to welcome Cindy McDonald, who's the Chief Operating Officer at Georgetown Hospital to the screen with me. We'll just give Cindy a bit of time to start her. There I am. <laughs> There she is. Awesome. Thank you for joining us, Cindy. Oh, uh, I know that you, you and your hospital team are tremendously busy, and we appreciate you taking the time to join us. But looking back, Cindy, it has been quite a year. I think that's a great place to start, Sandra. Thank you. And thank you to everybody who's joined us today. It's great to see you, even if seeing you means something different now than it used to. Um, yes, it's been a year. It has been quite a year. But I have to tell you, to start with, I want to say it has been, for most of us in this healthcare industry, it has been such a privilege and, and quite humbling to have been a part of this and to be part of the response that we've launched as an industry and as a hospital and as a province and as a healthcare worker. So uh, I wanted to say that up front. I can't believe that in seven days it will be a year, but on March 15th last year, following direction from the Ministry of Health and our Chief Medical Officer of Health, hospitals were asked to significantly start decreasing um, the things that we could, and that includes um, scheduled procedures, scheduled surgeries, and, and the reason for that was out of concern that we were going to get a, a huge influx of COVID-19 um, patients and that we wanted to preserve our resources, our beds, um, our talent and everything else for these patients that were coming in. So we were really looking to, to uh, anticipating that the hospital might be overwhelmed and, and making sure that we had capacity to address it. Um, I could speak for days on all the details about what we, uh, what we did, but suffice it to say, we pulled out all the stops to ensure the safety of our patients and our staff. It was in incredibly important that we maintain the safety of our staff as well. So what did that look like? We reduced our clinical work, postponed those scheduled surgeries that could be postponed. Uh, probably one of the most difficult things we did was limiting access to our buildings, which means no visitors, no volunteers, um, and that has been off and on throughout the year, and that has been challenging for everybody concerned. We also created plans to accommodate additional patients if necessary, and we did a lot more. I can tell you that it's a good thing that I um, didn't have to anticipate or look into a crystal ball because I don't think I would have believed that I'd be sitting here 51 weeks later and still dealing with a lot of the impact of, of, of COVID. Absolutely. So the last time we talked was back in October. And at that point we were, the hospital was gradually beginning to uh, really get back to full-time clinical services. Uh, visiting was allowed. Um, our volunteers were cautiously being welcomed back. But since that time, we really saw the second wave. Um, so what, what has been the hospital's response? Because I understand it's been different from the first time around. It has, but I think it's re been really helpful that we went through that first wave and we took the time over the summer to pause and consider what we learned. So what were the lessons learned that could really um, inform our second wave response? And we did learn some things over, over the years. So our response was one that, that greatly benefited from those lessons learned. The biggest thing was that our pandemic plan has been designed so that we can ramp up and ramp down as required. And we should be able to do that 
in a very nimble and flexible way. And I think we've learned how to do that better. So during the summer months, we were able to gradually reintroduce a lot of the procedures that we had postponed or deferred. A lot of programs returned to 100% capacity. We started doing um, uh, uh, elective surgeries or scheduled surgeries again, and we really ramped up that service. But this time there was strong support for hospitals to continue with the services that we were able to provide based on bed, bed occupancy, staffing, and the burden of disease that we were seeing, not just in the hospital, but among our staff. This, this, this illness is community acquired as well, and some of our staff um, acquired it, uh, as well as patients. So as a result, we were able to provide clinical services, sometimes at a reduced level, but we've done more throughout the second wave than we did in the first wave. And probably the most obvious example was during wave one, we redirected obstetrics to the Milton site so that we could free up that unit. This time around, we did um, a lot of reconfiguring of our inpatient medical surgical unit so that we could maintain um, maternal newborn care here at the hospital. So we did not redirect obstetrics this time in, in wave two. So that was a noticeable difference and one that we benefited from our experience in wave one. Unfortunately, our volunteers have still not had the opportunity to return. And if I can do a shout out, we miss you. <laughs> We do miss our volunteers. I agree with that. Um, it's, it's not the same without seeing all the green vests around the hospital. Um, so uh, there's a lot that's changing on a daily, sometimes hourly, it feels like basis. So given today, what is the current situation at Georgetown Hospital? Well, unfortunately, last week we um, uh, experienced the, an outbreak on our medical surgical uh, inpatient unit. So for the interest in the interest of safety for everyone concerned <clears throat> and to try and get a handle on this outbreak and make sure it um, is over as soon as we can, it can get it over. We've done a few things. We've suspended uh, admissions to the MedSurg unit. We've suspended visiting to all patients with, with a few noticeable exceptions that um, we can make exceptions for, but they're one-offs. Um, so today is day six of suspending admissions to med surge. It's been a challenge and part of it is the old infrastructure in the building. We've got small rooms. We don't have the um, degree of private rooms that some of the newer hospitals have. Uh, so we've had to implement stronger measures to end this outbreak. All other services at the hospital are, op are open and it's really important that everybody understands our emergency services are still open. We are still a, um, a strong um, hospital, we want you to come here if you are in trouble and you need health care, come to our emergency department. We are admitting some patients on obstetrics and a secondary unit that we have set up, but we are redirecting many hospital admissions to either our Oakville or Milton sites. So if you come to hospital and you need admission, you will be admitted. It may not be here. It may be in Milton or Oakville. So that's what we're doing uh, as we try and bring this outbreak to a close. Great, and I know that I know the teams are working really hard here uh, to make sure that that outbreak is is over as quickly as it can be declared over. So we appreciate that all the work that's being done behind the scenes here. So um, many people may have seen um, there was a segment recently on CTV National News about the role that Halton Healthcare has played in supporting some of the area hospitals around us um, that have been overwhelmed, quite frankly, with with COVID nineteen patients. So it made us proud to know we are supporting the provincial response, but can you comment on how, uh, how basically the, the hospital has been supporting other hospitals in the area? Sure. I think when I said at the beginning that it's been a real privilege to be part of this, I think that's, that's a great example of, of where I think we've made a difference. We have played a significant role in the provincial pandemic response. And as you heard on that CTV segment, Halton Healthcare has accepted, we've actually taken over 200 transfers of uh, patients, the vast majority of them COVID positive in the beginning days as this incident management system table in Toronto was trying to reallocate um, patients based on beds that were available in the system. Um, both positive and negative COVID patients were coming. As it progressed, it became more and more COVID patients. So we've taken, and when I say we, I mean Halton Healthcare, Georgetown didn't take 200 patients. We have taken um, uh, 200, over 200 patients across the three sites of Halton Healthcare. And we've done that while maintaining services in our own communities. 
So we've also stepped up I've, over and above that, we've stepped up to um, provide access to testing centers, swabbing centers at all three sites of our hospital. And now uh, we're running the vaccination center for Halton region out of our Oakville Trafalgar Memorial Hospital. Um, and that has been um, an incredible experience as, as we uh, are responsible for getting those um, vaccinations into the arms of people um, that public health directs uh, who gets them and when they get them, but we're the ones that are administering them. So that's been an, an incredible experience and one that's been very positive, but uh, not an insignificant amount of, uh, of work to get those testing centers up. And you'll, later you'll hear from uh, Dr. Ghosh, who's been a real part of the success of that. In addition, we've continued to support long-term care, retirement homes, and other congregate settings all the way through wave one over the summer and um, over wave two as well. We have a team of about 14 people uh, that we deploy into homes that are in trouble and need it all over, not just our, our Halton region, but all over central region. So we've been into Mississauga, we were up into Woodbridge, um, so it's bringing additional resources and support when they're required to, to the places that they're required. So again, just an incredible experience and not one that any of us have done before. So it's been real learning curve for us. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's funny. I, I think you, you say you've never done that before, but I, I kind of think that this is my personal view. Uh, that Halton Healthcare kind of operates in that in that way a lot of the times as well. So maybe there were some key learnings that that we uh, that we were able to draw on from that. Uh, I always think it's very fortunate that Georgetown is part of a, a bigger system of Halton Healthcare and can uh, uh, share learnings and uh, resources and 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 just ideas with both Milton and Oakville um, as a system. And and you know when one needs help, the others can can adjust and, and, and lend a hand. So I think that's fantastic. And I think you're seeing that um, sort of in a broader scale um, through COVID throughout the province now. So I always thought we were doing it anyways. Um, <laughs> thanks. And is there anything else, any final thoughts that you'd like to share with our group today? I guess the most important thing to, to reinforce with everyone is that we are alive and well and we're operating full steam ahead. And we really wanna reassure you that our hospitals are safe and our emergency departments are open 24 seven to care for you in the event of an urgent, life-threatening illness or injury. Do not decide that it's not a safe place to come. If you need help, come to the hospital. And that's true across the province. We're lucky to be part of this Halton healthcare system. And we're lucky to be part of a provincial system that we can use the resources of other, our sister hospital sites, but also other hospitals if we need to. Careful planning and emergency preparedness has been a key to fighting COVID-19. And as we've progressed through this, our preparedness has changed as we've learned more. But our three hospitals have acted better than they ever had as one hospital system. And we continue to implement a, a very strong coordinated response to COVID-19. And I really want to personally thank everyone who supported our organization's response to this pandemic. On behalf of everybody at Halton Healthcare, thank you for doing your part by staying home, staying safe, and practicing physically di physical distancing. I heard a great line the other day from a friend of mine who said, stay positive and test negative. And that's probably good advice for all of us. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Cindy. And just so everybody knows, Cindy will be staying with us for the rest of the presentation. So if you have any questions for her, again, if you're on Zoom, please um, submit them through the question and answer function. And if you're on Facebook, please put it in the comments section. But I'd now like to invite Dr. Ananda Ghosh, Physician Leader, Quality and Patient Safety, and the Medical Lead for COVID-19 Assessment and Testing Centers at Holton Healthcare to join us and share a little bit more about COVID-19. So over to you, Dr. Ghosh. Uh, thanks very much, Sandra. It's a pleasure to be here uh, today. You can hear me okay? Yes. Okay, perfect. I'll just take a moment to um, put up some slides. Uh, if that's okay. Okay, great. So uh, th th thanks once again for, for having me today. Um, so I thought I'd take a little bit of time uh, to just go over some of the, the numbers. The first part is a lot of graphs, but uh, to review uh, how the second wave has gone uh, in, in uh, Halton region generally and also in Halton Hills uh, specifically. Uh, and then look at uh, in a little bit more detail uh, how that's impacted the hospital in terms of uh, the case numbers uh, that we've uh, uh, looked after in the hospital. 
Uh, and then um, I thought I'd close with um, looking at uh, vaccinations uh, in, in our region and, and what's been done to date, uh, as I know that there's a lot of uh, interest in, in, in vaccines currently, which is, uh, which is great. So I'll get started. Um, so with regards to uh, the cases in Halton region, so this is looking at uh, all four of the communities in Halton region, uh, and this is a graph showing the number of new cases uh, every day. Uh, starting at the first wave and, of course, showing the second wave. So to date, there have been uh, 900, uh, 694 cases of COVID-19 uh, in Halton region, and of those, uh, 260 are still active. Uh, so we can, what we can see from the, from the graph here is that the first wave uh, you know, started in, in March of 2020 and peaked uh, in about late April and early May, and, and case counts uh, really subsided through the summer. Uh, but the second wave uh, started in earnest in early September, and as is uh, quite obvious there, uh, was both uh, a longer second wave and a much larger second wave in terms of uh, new, uh, new cases on a daily basis. Um, in looking at the makeup of the second wave across uh, the region, what we see is that um, the second wave has been made up largely of uh, a younger population. And so um, if we look at uh, the uh, age 20 to 39 in specific, that made up a much smaller proportion of the first wave than a much larger uh, proportion of the uh, second wave. Looking now more at uh, more locally at uh, cases in, in Halton Hills. So this is the same uh, type of information, but zoomed in on, on Halton Hills. Uh, so to date, uh, since the start of the pandemic, there have been uh, 1,109 cases uh, in the Halton Hills community. And currently there are 51 uh, active cases. And so in terms of the timeline of wave one versus wave two, uh, Halton Hills followed uh, just like the rest of the region and the rest of the province uh, with the first wave uh, starting in March and peaking in uh, late April. Um, and once again, the second wave starting in early September uh, and peaking uh, through January. So what we can see is that the length of the wave was certainly uh, just as long. However, uh, more locally in Halton Hills, uh, the total number of daily cases uh, was uh, only a little bit higher uh, than the uh, first wave, uh, which means that uh, Halton Hills as a community certainly did very well in trying to flatten the curve uh, and, uh, and limit the size of the second wave. Uh, and in terms of the age breakdown, more locally in Halton Hills, uh, similarly, uh, the second wave was a much younger cohort than the first wave and was comprised of more people uh, in their uh, 20s and 30s uh, than, than the first wave. So how did this translate to uh, uh, demand for care at, at our hospitals at, at, at Halton Healthcare? Uh, so what we're uh, seeing on this graph is the number of admitted uh, patients with COVID-19 uh, at our three hospitals. The lighter yellow bars are ward patients and the darker yellow bars are our ICU uh, patients. And so currently uh, things certainly uh, subsided and, and uh, there are uh, 11 patients admitted with COVID-19 uh, across Halton Healthcare's three hospitals. None of those happen to be at Georgetown currently. Uh, and uh, presently we have three active cases of COVID-19 in our ICUs. Uh, so what we see is in terms of hospitalizations, as expected, this followed the number of cases in the community uh, with uh, the peak uh, occurring for first wave um, uh, in, uh, uh, in April uh, with the maximum number of admitted patients around 30, uh, whereas in the second wave, uh, our maximum number of admitted uh, COVID patients at any one time was about 60, so double the number. Uh, however, when we looked at the number of cases in the community in Halton region, uh, the number of new cases a day was actually five times higher in second wave versus the first wave. So we didn't see a commensurate uh, increase in, in terms of hospital demand. Uh, and that's just shown here uh, with this uh, next graph. So um, what we're showing here is looking at uh, number of cases in the community uh, compared to the number of uh, patients who required hospitalization. And so we see uh, the, the light gray bars are the number of active cases in, in the community. And so uh, we can see in first wave at most, there were about 200 active cases at one time, whereas in the second wave, we went up to almost 800 active cases. So uh, quadruple in terms of size, but uh, in terms of hospital demand, and that only uh, translated to about double the hospital demand, which fortunately uh, we were able to uh, manage. So as uh, Cindy alluded to, um, we uh, were able to support the broader provincial uh, health care uh, system um, because um, 
of the capacity in our hospitals and because of our communities uh, doing such a great job um, that um, there was uh, room in our hospital to be able to assist neighboring hospitals that were overwhelmed by COVID-19. So through the second wave, uh, in total, Halton Healthcare admitted almost 500 uh, COVID patients, uh, but 150 or almost 160 of those were actually transfers from other sites. So that's about a third of the uh, COVID cases that Halton Healthcare admitted through the second wave were in fact transfers from other neighboring hospitals to help out the uh, provincial system. Uh, certainly the majority of those were admitted uh, to Oakville, but I will uh, point out that Georgetown Hospital did accept 14 transfers of COVID positive patients. And uh, for, for a hospital the size uh, of Georgetown, that's, that's no small feat. Uh, and so Georgetown was certainly uh, punching above its weight class uh, through the second wave of the pandemic. And uh, receive more transfers than than uh, other hospitals of, of larger size. So really helping out uh, the, the provincial system. So I'll uh, shift gears now and uh, take some time to talk about uh, the COVID-19 vaccinations, which uh, I sincerely hope are our, are our way out of this, uh, this pandemic. So in terms of uh, vaccination in Halton region, uh, so this is actually led by Halton Public Health, and uh, it is uh, their responsibility and oversight to ensure uh, vaccination of the communities and, and population in our region. And so it's Halton Public Health that uh, defines the prioritization of the populations that will be vaccinated. Um, but uh, as these things go, the, the, the freezers themselves for where the vaccine is delivered are actually housed at, at Halton Healthcare at the Oakville Hospital. And so we have very careful co-management with them uh, to set the plan uh, for who's going to be vaccinated and where and do very careful monitoring of our inventory uh, to make sure that we have the supply of vaccine we need to execute that plan. And I'm sure everybody has heard uh, lots of information in the media about some of the challenges that we've had with, uh, with vaccine supply. Um, but uh, fortunately, working very closely with public health and planning uh, as closely, uh, carefully as possible, uh, we have been able to proceed with uh, the vaccination of, of our prioritized groups and have never had to uh, cease vaccination in our region uh, completely. So in terms of the current prioritization or eligibility for vaccine, our, the focus really has been on the most vulnerable. Uh, and as I uh, shared previously, it's in really in long-term care homes that uh, COVID-19 has had the most devastating effects and, and therefore very appropriately this was the first priority uh, in terms of getting vaccine rolled out uh, was to uh, long-term care homes and retirement homes both for the residents, the staff and the essential caregivers who need to go in uh, to those homes. Uh, and from there, uh, we have also uh, prioritized at-risk healthcare workers. We started first with uh, those at highest risk uh, in the hospital, so those who were working in our emergency departments, our intensive care units, on the COVID wards, and on our assessment centers. Uh, but we've been able to expand this to all patient-facing um, staff in hospitals, and now most more recently uh, to uh, patient-facing uh, healthcare providers in the community, so family physicians in their offices, dentists in their offices, uh, medical specialists and surgeons uh, in the community, as well as their uh, staff and office workers are all uh, coming through for vaccine uh, now, which is, uh, which is great. Um, we've also uh, um, been uh, vaccinating the recipients of, of chronic home care and also the healthcare providers that go into the homes to provide that home care. And then most recently, uh, Halton Public Health has been able to open up clinics uh, and start booking appointments for all uh, adults in, in uh, Halton region over the age of 80. With regards to the vaccines that are available in Halton region, so to date, it's only been the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine uh, that has been allocated to Halton region. So these decisions are made at a provincial level. Uh, and so uh, we have uh, only received the Pfizer vaccine uh, so far. Uh, however, the Moderna vaccine, uh, I expect, will be allocated here uh, very soon. Uh, and we've heard uh, that there has now been approval of the AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine uh, with deliveries expected soon. Uh, this vaccine, because it has much less stringent uh, storage and handling requirements is primed to be uh, distributed in a more um, uh, widespread manner. And so uh, the distribution plan for the AstraZeneca and Oxford vaccines will be through pharmacies and primary care rather than uh, the hospital and, and mass vaccination clinics. So uh, looking forward to having more options there. And then uh, most recently, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine has also been approved. The real advantage of that vaccine is that it's a single dose, which certainly makes uh, the logistics much easier. Uh, I don't have a clear sight line yet for when uh, delivery of that is uh, yet expected. 
So I do just want to speak a little bit about the vaccination center that we've established at the Oakville Hospital. Uh, so it was on the 11th of December that we were notified that the Oakville Hospital was selected amongst the very first wave of vaccination centers to be stood up uh, in the province. Uh, we uh, weren't told when the vaccine was coming, nor how much was coming, but we were told to get ready. Uh, and so on December 22nd, we received our first shipment of vaccine and we're very happy uh, the very next day to begin administering doses, uh, the very first do doses going to uh, workers in, in long-term care facilities in our region. Uh, and from there, we've uh, really ramped up and, and, and tried not to look back. And so to date, the Oakville Hospital Vaccination Centre has administered over 25,000 uh, doses of vaccine. Uh, and we have built our capacity uh, so that if called upon and with an uh, adequate supply that we could administer up to uh, 1,200 doses per day. Uh, but this, of course, is not the only vaccination activity that's been happening in our region. Uh, Halton Public Health has also been uh, actively vaccinating, and so they've established mobile teams uh, that have gone to all the long-term care homes as well as retirement homes and are now working through other congregate settings. And those uh, mobile teams have also administered more than 10,000 doses to date. And so uh, when uh, it was late January and we ran into supply issues, we did stand down the Oakville uh, vaccination center and redeployed our staff to join the paramedics alongside the mobile team so we could really accelerate uh, the vaccination of the long-term care homes. And uh, with that, we were able to get all of the uh, first doses uh, to residents in all long-term care homes in our region uh, by the end of January, and were able to get the high-risk retirement homes uh, done within the first week of March. So a real concerted effort there uh, got our most vulnerable populations uh, vaccinated uh, in, in short order. Uh, and now public health, as I mentioned, uh, is uh, opening up uh, uh, community vaccination sites where the focus is on the population of those uh, over the age of 80. And there are five sites planned to open. And the first site in Halton Hills actually opened this past weekend uh, successfully, I understand, uh, on the 6th of March. So the first, uh, first residents over 80 in Halton Hills uh, have already started receiving vaccines uh, there. And then this is uh, a couple slides I literally added minutes uh, before this presentation because uh, this data is hot off the press from the Ontario uh, science table and it shows that the strategy of vaccinating long-term care uh, residents is working. And so what this graph is showing, this is based on modeling data uh, where the dotted lines are the expected number of cases we would have seen based on mathematical modeling of both long-term care residents and uh, healthcare workers in long-term care. And the uh, solid line is what's actually been seen. And so that's sort of the predicted impact of the vaccine. Um, but uh, modeling and, and predictions are one thing, uh, but uh, this next graph actually shows real data. Uh, and so what this is showing, uh, I'll start on the left side. Uh, so this is residents uh, uh, in long-term care homes. Um, uh, where the blue line is residents who are actually in long-term care homes and we can see the vaccination um, impact uh, compared to the orange line, which is a control population of similarly aged people not living in long-term care homes and thus would not have had access to uh, the vaccine in the same uh, fashion. And so what we've known from the first wave is that in fact case, uh, case counts are usually higher in long-term care homes rather than, than lower, um, but we've seen with the vaccine that really has flattened uh, the, the curve and, and, and made a significant impact. And that's seen both in residents as well as healthcare workers uh, on the right side where uh, the blue line is healthcare workers in long-term care homes uh, compared to other healthcare workers uh, of a similar age uh, in the orange line who did not have access to vaccine um, uh, at the same time uh, because um, uh, of the prioritization of, of um, uh, healthcare workers in long-term care homes. So again, we can see the impact of, of the vaccination program and, and truly is working. And so we have lots of reason to be optimistic as we're able to roll it out more broadly uh, that, that there will be uh, very positive impacts going forward. Okay, I think that's all I had to share for today. So I'll uh, hand it back to Sandra, but certainly happy to stick around for, for any questions that come up. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Ghosh. Um, that was a very informative presentation. I know we have lots of questions coming in, so we'll, we'll get you back in a bit. Uh, hopefully, we'll be able to get to, uh, to all of them. Um, and as a reminder, if you do want to put a question in uh, on Zoom, please use the question and answer feature. And if you're on Facebook, then just leave a message in the comments. So now I would like to introduce Helen Shalfot, professional practice clinician for rehabilitation and geriatrics at Halton Healthcare. And again, as I mentioned off the top, Helen's got some tips and tricks for us on how to stay healthy and active 
uh, as we uh, head through the hopefully the last part of this pandemic. So over to you, Helen. Thank you, Sandra. This talk will show you how to take a step towards better health today. So resilience is what you need to survive a pandemic. The first step towards resilience is to develop your own personal care plan. In healthcare, improving the health of our patients requires the team to come together to develop a comprehensive plan. What does your care plan look like? There are many essential components of a successful care plan to lead you along the road to better health. The key components for your physical health include movement, strengthening, stretching, balancing, and sleep. For your mental and emotional health, you also need to connect to yourself and others, have gratitude, and be thankful. You can go ahead. Let's start with movement. Every movement, every minute counts. Current recommendations are to accumulate 150 minutes a week of moderate to vigorous activity. So that's your walking, your biking, your swimming. Additionally, several hours of light physical activity are recommended. That would be your gardening or your housework. Recommendations really encourage you to limit sedentary behavior. So get up off that couch, get out of that office chair to a maximum of eight hours a day or less. And if you are required to sit, as I am <laughs> uh, with our office jobs, you really need to break up long periods of sitting as often as possible. Get up and walk around. And then further, no more than three hours of recreational screen time are recommended. So if you've never exercised ever or currently have issues with your health, please check with your doctor first before starting an exercise program so they can guide you in the right direction. What happens to you when you move? Well, your breathing rate increases, your heart rate increases, and that boosts your circulation, sending oxygen-rich blood to all of your working muscles. But at the same time, sending blood and nutrients to your organs, your heart, lungs, liver, kidneys, skin, brain, all improving or maintaining their health. And this helps to reduce your risk factors for things like heart disease, stroke, and cancer. And it does this by doing things like lowering blood pressure, controlling blood sugar, improving your cholesterol profile, and managing body fat. The endorphins released during and after exercise boost your mood and give you energy, leaving you wanting more. Focus better. Heal better. Sleep better. Partner better. Create better. Love better. Breathe better. Learn better. Laugh better. Lead better. Think better. Work better. Friend better. Unwind better. Happy better. Everything gets better when you get active. Everything does get better when you get active. What are the other components of your personal care plan? Well, this is what you can do during a pandemic. If you're used to going to a gym, make your house into a gym. Use the basement, garage, driveway, or backyard. Be creative. Do something virtual, either on your own or with a friend. Play a DVD or just put some music on and move spontaneously. Enjoy the great outdoors. The last little bit of snow, you can have your, your snowshoeing, your skiing, your skating. You can also hike, bike, and pretty soon we'll be able to swim. Skipping is also a fantastic uh, way to get your heart rate up. And it doesn't take much equipment and it takes very little space. Next slide, please. Strengthening. Strengthening helps build muscle and also build bone, which overall improves your function. 
When you're highly functional, you're able to get through your daily activities with less effort, and that helps to boost your endurance. You have enough energy at the end of the day to do a few more things. You can improve your strength by using hand weights, resistance bands, or use your body weight by doing something like squats or lunges, planks, or wall push-ups. The recommendations are to strengthen major muscle groups at least two times a week. Anytime you're working to strengthen a muscle, you need to make sure you achieve balance by also stretching it. And this helps to restore alignment in the body. So you maintain the length of your muscles to keep your joints in a good position, and that helps to prevent imbalance. When you hold the stretch, make sure you do that, but do not hold your breath. When you're breathing, you wanna breathe in through the nose and out through the mouth. Breathing in through the nose warms, humidifies, and helps to cleanse the air. So it is the ideal way to get that oxygen into your lungs. Many people don't think to integrate balance into their care plan. Balance helps improve your agility, your responsiveness to changes, such as changes in terrain in the environment. So that would be uneven sidewalks or slippery patches. So overall, it helps you to prevent falls. You can achieve this by participating in a virtual Tai Chi class, dancing, or yoga. After all this activity, make sure that you are recharging with rest. The Canadian guidelines suggest that quality is more important than quantity. You should be trying to achieve restorative sleep. As far as quantity goes, between seven and nine hours if you're an adult per evening, or per day, uh, between seven and eight hours for seniors. And you really wanna create the right sleep environment for you, whether it's quiet, whether it's dark, whatever works for you. And practice consistent bed and wake up times. We recommend that you limit vigorous activity, caffeine, large meals, and screen time to help prepare your body for bed. For your mental health, make sure that you nurture your emotions. When you make meaningful connections, you're not only benefiting your health, but that of others. Reach out to the ones you love by phone, email, text. I know many people are tired of Zoom, but you could play a virtual game by Zoom, play cards, send a card or write a letter, be kind to one another. My mother-in-law recently received a, a note from a friend that had a tea bag inside and it said, had a cup of tea and think of me. And she was very touched by that gesture. One unique element of the pandemic is that it's affected everyone across the globe. We are all in this together. So together, there is togetherness in staying apart. Appreciate what you have and focus on what you can do and not the opposite. Share these feelings with others. Journal, draw, photograph. Embrace your inner artist and find creative ways to express your appreciation of the beauty around you. Oprah Winfrey said, be thankful for what you have and you'll end up having more. If you concentrate on what you don't have, then you'll never ever have enough. Every journey starts with one step. And resilience can help you navigate the detours in life's journey and keep you on a healthy path. Celebrate your successes. Learn from your struggles. Come and take a step towards better health and resilience today. Thank you for the opportunity to share this information with you today. I will also be here for the question and answer period should you have any questions. Back to you, Sandra. Great. Hey, thanks, Helen. And actually, Helen, if you can hang on, I think we're going to we're going to start with you with a couple of questions. Um, OK, I know we have lots for Dr. Ghosh, so we'll get to him in a minute. And we also have a few for Cindy. But thought we'd start off with you since you just gave us a great presentation. So um, I have a question here that came in about somebody with limited mobility. So are there are there some tips that they can uh, you know, take away from today on how they can help uh, stay active? Absolutely. Staying active and mobile is the key to either maintaining or improving your mobility. 
For those who have limited mobility, you really need to be very mindful of staying safe because there is a risk for falls and not to overexert, which also can cause a lot of um, fatigue, which can lead to falls. So I'd really recommend to start simple and build slowly. Consider a seated chair exercise program, for example. As I was sitting here listening to these great presentations from my esteemed colleagues, I was doing some marching in the chair. I was pushing the up on the chair with my triceps. Again, just integrating some activity into what I was doing from the safety of my chair. Um, someone with limited mobility could do light weights or band exercises from a seated position. Even abdominal exercises can be done from a seated position, so you don't need to worry about getting on and off the floor. You can progress to standing even behind the chair, holding the chair for balance. And a little bit of challenge of balance in a safe situation can really, really help to reinforce the body's way to cope with disturbances in balance. I know no one likes to get wet during winter, but exercising in water is also an excellent way to uh, get some mobility um, improvement in water. The buoyancy of the water, if there's minerals like salt, that also really helps you feel more mobile and get a very comprehensive strengthening program done in water. And lastly, if you have specific questions, I'd recommend you work with a physiotherapist, which is what I am, or occupational therapist or kinesiologist to come up with an individualized program. Great, wonderful. Um, and for people that maybe don't have weights at home, obviously we're, we're kind of still stuck at home um, and maybe don't have the traditional gym equipment. What are some things around the house they could use to, uh, to help them with some of their, their exercises? Really anything that can fit safely and comfortably into the palm of your hand. Uh, water bottles, you can begin with them um, either empty or partially full and then progress to filling them up with something like a sand or even go up to like a pebble or gravel in order to progress the weight. Um, even socks, I've seen people put things in socks because the, it's easy to, to wrap around your hands so that you don't have too much fatigue holding on to the, uh, the weight that you've made. Um, soup cans are also really good depending on the size of your hand, um, pop cans and that sort of thing. Um, but beyond that, I really encourage people to use their body weight as resistance. So I mentioned doing things like squats. You don't have to do a full squat. You put your body against the wall, just bend your knees slightly, slide down the wall and slide back up. Just go as much as is comfortable. Lunges as well. You don't have to go into a deep lunge to get some muscle benefits. Uh, personally, I love wall push-ups. I do them when I'm waiting for my printing to come out at the copier. So you would just lean your hands against the wall, lean forward and push yourself back. Um, and also planks. I'm a, I'm a big fan of core strengthening. So using your body weight in a front plank or side plank as well can really help increase your strength. Wonderful, okay. Um, I think we're gonna move on to Cindy right now, but thanks Helen, awesome tips and tricks. And we can certainly uh, get out there and, and keep active while we can inside and then hopefully take some of this outside as the weather improves. So thank you so much for joining us today. Thank and you. I'm gonna uh, invite Cindy back for, um, we've got a couple of questions for Cindy. So uh, here's a quick question maybe. Um, have we seen many flu cases this year in the hospital? We have seen flu, but not as much as we would typically see uh, in, in flu season. <clears throat> I suspect, and, and Dr. Ghosh can weigh in here probably more um, scientifically or clinically than I can, but I think all the measures that we've done as a society to prevent ourselves from getting COVID have actually influenced whether or not we, we got flu. The social distancing, the washing hands, wearing a mask has had a positive impact and we have not seen the flu cases that we would typically see. Great. Uh, well, that's a good thing that came out, I guess. Um, yes. So can you also talk about, um, we, we had um, a, a while ago, um, the implementation of rapid uh, COVID-19 testing uh, came to Georgetown Hospital. So can you talk to us a little bit about that? Yes, um, the rapid testing is not um, a test that we can use to the exclusion of all other tests. It has some limited um, applicability. It's a, it's a, if for want of a better term, it's called a, a bedside or a point of care test. 
So you do the test right while the, the patient is there and you've got a, a, a machine that it takes about 10 or 15 minutes to get the result back, as opposed to sending it to the lab and waiting several hours. We use it particularly um, with to make decisions around where we're going to place patients when we admit them. Um, so that if they are a negative rapid test, we, all, we do follow it up with the regular lab test called a PCR test. Uh, but it has given us a, a, a fair degree of, of um, security or confidence around our bed placement so that we're not waiting for a day, um, 24 hours to get a, a lab result back before we, we make decisions about where we place patients. Okay, great. Cindy, thank you very much. I'm going to move on to Dr. Gosh now, just because we do have a bunch of questions for him. I'm going to try and um, sort of bucket them into different categories. But um, I guess the first one is, what is the likelihood of a third wave happening? Uh, okay, uh, the third wave question. Um... Loaded question right off the top. Sure. So, uh, you know, with all things, we're, we're cautious about making predictions and, and predicting the future. Um, so there are a couple of um, parts, I think, that play into the risks of a third wave. One is that we are in, in a stage right now where we're easing restrictions, uh, and so we're going to have more interactions and more opportunities for transmission. Um, and the second part that really plays into concerns about a third wave are uh, what, what are the variants of concern. So some mutations in virus that we've been able to uh, consistently identify. Um, there's a, a UK variant of concern, a South African and, uh, and a, a Brazilian uh, variant of concern. And, and, and the, the risk that these uh, uh, variants might transmit a little bit more uh, easily. Uh, so, it's important to understand the context um, that, you know, this is what viruses do. Viruses do mutate, they do change, they do drift. Um, and this is, you know, it's part of the reason that we have to get a new flu shot every year is because the, the flu virus is, is always changing. I think what's different now is we're watching this virus more closely than we've ever watched any other virus. And so we are uh, picking up these changes and we're giving them names and we're following them, them closely. Um, but to, to a certain degree, this is, this is exactly what we expect uh, would happen. So will there be a third wave? I think we're seeing that our decrease in cases has plateaued um, and we've seen uh, potentially a slight uptick uh, in, in number of cases over a couple of days, not enough yet to call a trend. Uh, so I think there is a possibility of a, of a third wave uh, coming. And if we remember the first wave actually peaked in uh, April and given the, the seasonality of the virus, we would expect sort of a, a similar peak. Um, so yes, possibility of a third wave. Do I think it will be larger than the second wave? I do not. Um, and what I'm hopeful of is that if we can get our most vulnerable um, uh, in our population vaccinated, that even if there are rising case numbers, that that's not going to translate into uh, hospitalizations and, and, and hopefully not death. So while we might see more and more case numbers, hopefully um, people won't be getting as, uh, as sick. So that's uh, the optimistic view. So do I think there will be probably, yes, uh, probably in April, I don't think it'll be as big as the second and I'm gonna be optimistic that it won't uh, result in as many people being sick. Okay, great. Uh, so you mentioned that right now in Holton region, um, it's the Pfizer vaccine that's available. Um, but there has been obviously a lot of media reports on the efficacy of the various um, vaccines. And when the, you know, when the rollout continues, uh, different age groups and different ways of getting the vaccine happens, um, you know, should people be waiting for the Pfizer or the Moderna vaccines because they have a higher um, effectiveness rate as reported in the media? Uh, yeah, thank you for the, the question. Um, so I think the first thing I would say is that uh, the best vaccine to get is the first one that you're able to and the first one that's uh, available to you. Um, because being uh, having a vaccine is better than not being vaccinated at all. Um, and I think I would just caution about some of the reported um, efficacy in, in the media. We saw, so we sort of hear about the 95% number for the Pfizer vaccine, the 94% number for the Moderna vaccine, uh, but only a 65% number for, for the AstraZeneca. Um, that is really only looking at one data point, which is a number of people who go on to get symptoms and get, go on to get a positive test for COVID. 
uh, and how well does it prevent uh, that? But there are a number of other things to look at more than just uh, who, who gets mild symptoms and then who gets a positive COVID test. Uh, also important are to look at uh, of the people who were vaccinated versus those who weren't. How many people got sick enough that they had to go to hospital uh, and, 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 um, uh, and other important things like that. And, and on those fronts, it looks like all of the vaccines have, have uh, important effects and, and do provide good protection. Uh, and so I, I would um, uh, again say that uh, the best vaccine to get is the first one that you're able to get. Okay, great. And uh, it, it, the time between the first and second dose, is Holton extending that time frame at all? Uh, we know that I believe with the Pfizer, it's, I don't know whether that's the four week one, um, that, uh, but there has been talk again of, of extending those timelines so that more people can get those first shots. So can you comment on what Holton right now is doing? Yeah, so in Holden Region, just like everybody else, we're following the direction that we receive from the Ministry of Health. And so these uh, decisions are actually made at a, uh, a provincial level. Uh, so when we first started administering the Pfizer vaccine, we were providing second doses uh, in the uh, 21 to 21, uh, 28 day interval. Uh, but when supply uh, became a concern at the direction of the province, we pushed all second doses back to 35 days, which is where we continue to administer them now. Uh, and so the National Advisory Committee on Immunization has suggested that for uh, the Pfizer vaccine, the second dose can be pushed out to uh, four months. Uh, we have not yet received direction to, to do so. And so currently, as people are scheduling appointments, we're scheduling their second dose in 35 days. Uh, if the time comes that we receive direction from the ministry to push out those second doses, then, then we certainly will do so. Um, I'll say that the, the rationale behind doing so certainly makes sense. Uh, there is a good amount of protection provided by the first dose and getting uh, more people with a, a very good amount of protection is much better from a societal standpoint in terms of uh, reducing transmission of the virus uh, than having perfect protection in a smaller uh, number of people. So certainly good rationale for the uh, NACI recommendations. But uh, these are not uh, things that we're doing independently in our region. Uh, we are uh, following ministry direction about these. Great. Uh, I'm going to ask one more question. And before I ask it, I will um, tell all the people that have sent in their wonderful questions. A number of the questions that are being asked are ones that do relate to um, public health. And we do have to remember that public health makes the decisions around the vaccines. Um, and Dr. Ghosh, jump in after I'm done and correct me if I've said anything wrong. Uh, but they decide who gets it when uh, the definitions of um, who, it, for example, is considered an essential caregiver. So I really encourage you to keep an eye on the public health website uh, for the most up-to-date information. It is changing rapidly, obviously. There are announcements just about every day. Uh, so I appreciate that people have sent in a bunch of questions on this, but I, I do think there are ones that, that Dr. Ghosh, unfortunately, is going to say that's up to public health um, in terms of uh, what happens next. But perhaps you can give a, at least a broad statement about um, sort of when things are going to start easing. Like, is there a, a threshold of number of people vaccinated? We know that in, you know, people are getting vaccinated, but not much has changed. Um, and should ch people be changing, or, you know, are they allowed to sort of change their behavior at this point if they've been vaccinated? I think that's a big question people have is now that I'm vaccinated, can I do anything differently? Can I have people over to my house? Can I, you know, do I still need to wear a mask? So can you just comment in general about as we go through this vaccination proce process, which is going to take some time, just what people, sh you know, should or should not be doing um, to be safe for them and be safe for other people? Uh, sure. Um, so um, in terms of those who are vaccinated, uh, at this point, they everyone still needs to follow the same public health uh, measures in terms of uh, following current restrictions around um, uh, leaving the house or, or gatherings and, and, and mask use uh, in, in public. Uh, the goal of, of vaccination is to contribute to the overall reduction of cases in the community, and it's cases in the community that will guide um, the directions around easing uh, restrictions. And so we all need to follow the same restrictions, but if uh, the more of us who get vaccinated and the more we adhere to those restrictions, the faster those case numbers will fall and the faster those restrictions can be eased. Okay, wonderful. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. We are a couple of minutes over time, but I think everybody uh, understands that we've had some great discussions here. We have had a lot of um, great information that's been presented today, and we certainly thank our, our speakers uh, for making the time today out of their busy schedules to join us. Um, I would say with, with regards to everything that's going on with vaccinations, I again encourage everybody to keep an eye on 
uh, the public health website. They are the ones that are making the decisions locally in Halton. Um, obviously, there's provincial announcements that come out regularly as well that uh, that help inform what's going on and what's coming. But uh, as things are changing rapidly, um, it's a good idea for all of us to just uh, keep an eye on, on what's uh, coming out and keep an eye on the official sources. And, and the Halton Public Health website is, uh, is a good place to go to find out what's the most up-to-date information. So I want to uh, just close by thanking everybody today. We will be sending out a short survey, so please fill that out. That does help us plan, um, in particular, some topics you may want to hear on our next town hall. So we appreciate your feedback and appreciate you taking the time today. Um, if you uh, want to connect with us, uh, please do so at the foundation. Uh, our website and our phone number are on the screen right now. And uh, once again, thank you to uh, Cindy McDonald, Dr. Ananda Ghosh, and Helen Shelfout um, for joining us today. And uh, I hope you had a good time. Um, please give us some feedback and have a safe and enjoyable afternoon. Thanks everybody, bye.